Welcome to part two of the Finding Common Ground webinar series. The first webinar in the series, Managing Pests with a Plan, reviewed how we can manage pests using integrated pest management. Today, I will talk about how to apply integrated pest management strategies to the honeybee pest called Varroa destructor. This webinar is called Managing Varroa Destructor with a Plan. My name is Anna Heck. I'm a beekeeper and I work with Michigan State University's Michigan Pollinator Initiative. Previously, I worked with the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. One of the biggest obstacles beekeepers face is the Varroa mite. Varroa are in most parts of the world. In these areas, it isn't a matter of if a colony has Varroa, but how many mites the colony has. Varroa mites are parasites that feed on honeybees and spread diseases between bees. Many beekeepers don't understand the importance of managing Varroa, and even beekeepers who commit themselves to managing Varroa often find that they still lose colonies to mites. Varroa is a pest specific to honeybees. It was originally a pest of the Asiatic honeybee, and it transferred to the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, in the mid-1900s. Practicing integrated pest management includes identifying, monitoring, and managing pests. Beekeepers can identify varroa and or signs of varroa damage. In order to monitor and manage varroa, it is helpful and important to understand its life cycle. A female mite enters the cell of a larva just before it is capped. The varroa mite crawls to the bottom of the cell underneath the honeybee larva. 70 hours after capping, the female mite will lay an egg that will become a male. Every 30 hours, she will lay another egg. These eggs will become females. The male offspring and female offspring mate. When the mites feed on the pupa, they transmit viruses. They damage the bees during the most delicate phase of development. When the bee emerges, the original mite emerges as well as one more daughter. The rest of the mites are not developed enough to survive. In drone cells, two additional mites can emerge with the original female. The reproductive female mites will move to other bees. Mites tend to recognize and prefer nurse-aged honeybees, which puts the mites close to the developing honeybee larvae. The mites will leave the adult honeybees and enter honeybee larval cells to reproduce. Mites can continue to reproduce as long as there is brood in the hive. Mites spread pathogens when they feed on developing honeybee pupae. They also spread pathogens when they feed on adult bees. Because the varroa mites are often reproducing in honeybee pupal cells, they can sometimes be difficult to detect. Varroa mites are relatively large on the body of a honeybee, and most people are able to see mites without a microscope. Nevertheless, most beekeepers won't see varroa mites on bees unless the varroa mite levels are very high. Since varroa mites are often on the underside of honeybees and between their abdominal segments, beekeepers won't be able to see most varroa mites just by looking at a frame of bees. One principle of integrated pest management is to monitor pest levels to inform management and interventions. It is important for beekeepers to frequently monitor varroa mite levels in their colonies. In northern climates, varroa mite reproduction depends on the season. A lack of honeybee brood in winter in northern climates makes it difficult for varroa to reproduce. In the winter, the mites in the colony are on adult bees. When the queen begins to lay more in the spring, the varroa in the colony have an opportunity to reproduce. In the late spring and summer, there is typically lots of brood in the colony, which means that varroa are able to reproduce in the brood nest. In the fall, mites feed on and damage developing winter bees. When queens stop laying in the fall, varroa are not able to reproduce. The varroa in the colony will be on adult bees. Varroa mites have an exponential growth curve. Their reproduction in spring and summer can lead to very high numbers in the fall. Beekeepers can monitor varroa in the spring, summer, and fall seasons. In northern climates, varroa levels are generally low in the winter and early spring. Once the brood nest expands in the spring, the varroa mite levels increase as well. 
When the honeybee colony reaches its peak population in the summer, varroa populations generally grow as well, since there is a lot of brood for them to use for reproduction. Once the honeybee population decreases in the fall, the varroa levels may remain high. Since colonies don't have much brood in the fall, many of the mites will be on adult bees instead of in sealed brood reproducing. Beekeepers in northern climates expect varroa levels to be at their highest in the late summer and the fall. This photo shows mites taken from a sample of 300 bees. Beekeepers want to prevent spikes in mite levels. Even if the beekeeper can manage to dramatically reduce the mite level, the pathogen spread by mites may make a colony sick. Beekeepers should manage mites in colonies regardless of whether or not they expect the colony to die in order to prevent mites from infesting other colonies. It is recommended that beekeepers monitor varroa at least once per month throughout the beekeeping season. It is important to test colonies for varroa infestations before and after a management strategy or intervention in order to evaluate if the strategy was effective. Consistent, long-term monitoring enables beekeepers to predict and address spiking mite populations. Monitoring varroa has several important advantages. First, monitoring may help beekeepers detect unexpected spikes in mite levels. Second, monitoring may help beekeepers prevent overtreatment. Beekeepers might find lower levels of mites than expected and may be able to delay or skip treatment. Overuse of varroa treatments may be hard on bees. In some cases, overtreatment may lead to varroa resistance. Some treatments can build up in the comb. Overtreatment can also be expensive. Finally, mite cycles vary from year to year. A beekeeper who treats solely based on data from previous years or other beekeepers may treat when it is too early or too late for their bees. Beekeepers can monitor varroa by using the powdered sugar roll or the alcohol wash test. Using a sticky board is not recommended by itself since mite drop does not easily translate into a treatment threshold. Beekeepers can make their own powdered sugar roll or alcohol test kits or purchase kits. Both tests involve collecting a sample of 300 bees in a jar and separating the mites from the bees in order to count the number of mites. It's important to follow protocols for accurate measurement. The University of Minnesota Bee Lab has several online tutorials on the Bee Lab YouTube channel about how to monitor Varroa using the powdered sugar roll test. The Mite Check app provides instructions on how to monitor Varroa. Since beekeeping educators noticed that many beekeepers were not shaking their sample of bees well, the app includes a shake trainer where beekeepers can shake their phones to learn how hard and quick to shake a sample of bees. The app also allows beekeepers to report levels to mite check and directs beekeepers to helpful resources. Mite check is an online platform that allows beekeepers to report their mite levels and see the highest mite level reported in each county. We encourage beekeepers to participate in the citizen science program. Many universities and organizations came together to develop and support mite check. It is important for beekeepers to manage their varroa levels. As part of integrated pest management, pests can be managed with cultural, physical or mechanical, chemical or biological controls. Cultural controls are practices that reduce pest establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival. Since varroa mites need honeybee brood for their reproduction, creating a break in the honeybee brood cycle also creates a break in varroa reproduction cycles. Beekeepers can create a break in the brood by caging or removing the queen or by doing a walk away divide. It should be noted that honeybees will normally raise new queens in these situations. Another type of cultural control involves promoting genetic stocks that resist pathogens and parasites. Some honeybee colonies display hygienic behavior, meaning that workers in the colony have the ability to detect, uncap, and remove pupae from cells where varroa are reproducing. When bees uncap and remove pupae from cells, the reproduction cycle of varroa is interrupted, limiting the population growth of the mites. A second genetic trait is grooming, in which adult bees detect and groom varroa mites off of other adult bees. A mechanical or physical control kills a pest directly or makes its environment unsuitable. Since varroa have a tendency to prefer drone cells 8 to 12 times more than worker cells, beekeepers can use drone brood as a mechanical or physical control. In this control, beekeepers give honeybees a frame with the cell size for raising drones. Bees will build comb, and the queen will normally fill the comb with male eggs. 
Once the cells are capped, the beekeeper removes the frame and the brood, which may also remove many mites from the colony. It is important that the beekeeper removes the frame before the drones emerge, since failure to remove the frame may increase the colony's varroa levels. Drone comb removal can reduce mite loads, but in most situations, beekeepers must also use other methods of control to keep mite levels low. A biological control is the use of natural enemies such as predators, parasites, pathogens, and competitors to control pests and their damage. Biological controls are often used in agriculture to control pests. While researchers have looked for biological control options for Varroa, they have not yet identified a biological control option that effectively and safely controls Varroa mite levels. A chemical control is a pest management method that involves using naturally derived and or synthetic chemicals to manage pests. In northern climates, it is difficult to keep bees alive without relying on chemical controls for Varroa. Chemical controls may be naturally or synthetically derived. Right now, naturally derived treatments include oxalic acid, Mitoway quickstrips, Formic Pro, Hopgard 2, Apigard, and Apolifar. Synthetically derived treatments include Apovar, Apistan, and Checkmite Plus. The University of Minnesota Bee Lab recommends that backyard beekeepers in northern climates only use naturally derived treatments. The Honey Bee Health Coalition compiles varroa management options. For information about how and when to use varroa treatments, consult the Honey Bee Health Coalition's website. Beekeepers are legally obligated to only apply treatments that are labeled for use to control varroa in honey bee colonies and to follow the treatment's label. Beekeepers should pay attention to other restrictions on the label. For example, some treatments restrict use based on temperature, brooding colony, or honey supers. It is important for the beekeeper applying the treatment to wear correct personal protective equipment, or PPE. Beekeepers should manage varroa when levels reach their action threshold. A threshold of 3% infestation, or 3 mites per 100 bees, has commonly been used, but your threshold may need to be different depending on your location and the time of year. The Honey Bee Health Coalition's Varroa Management Decision Tool has examples of acceptable and dangerous mite levels based on the colony's population and brood phase. Beekeepers should try to control Varroa before they begin to damage the colony. Beekeepers can reduce mite and pathogen loads in their colonies by managing mites. It is often difficult for beekeepers to determine when and how to manage mites. We wish we had a mite management plan that would work for every beekeeper and every colony. Unfortunately, mite management isn't that simple. Beekeepers will need to consider their varroa levels, the time of year, the size of their colonies, whether or not there is brood present, whether or not they are using honey supers, and the threat of horizontal transmission when making decisions. For more information about how varroa transfer between honeybee colonies, watch the next webinar, The Impact of Horizontal Transmission on Mite Infestation. In summary, it is important for beekeepers to take Varroa seriously and anticipate mite growth in colonies. For more information about Varroa, consult the University of Minnesota Bee Lab and Bee Squad's website and social media, Michigan State University's Varroa Resources at KeepBeesAlive.org, the Honey Bee Health Coalition, and the Bee Informed Partnership. Thank you for taking the time to learn about how integrated pest management strategies can help beekeepers manage Varroa. Please review the other webinars in this Finding Common Ground six-part webinar series to learn more about honeybees and how to keep them healthy.